Good morning, everyone. We'd like to welcome you to the Mesa City Council study session for the morning of Thursday, May the 6th. Uh, the first item on our agenda is to hear a presentation, discuss, and provide direction on a summary wrap-up of the fiscal year 2021-22 budget. Mr. Brady. Thank you, Mayor. Um, we just have a few items to go over with Council, and we wanted to appreciate Council um, for <laughs> the long hours on the, the budget review. Um, the staff recognized the Council had many really good questions and um, input, and so um, today we, we have um, a few slides. Brian can kind of go through them, but what we want to also show you, as you know, not every department was able to come and make a presentation, but there are... Um, some improvements, some additions to the budget that are included with some of those departments. So we just want to briefly go over those highlights. And then there was also some input that we received from council we're trying to address in this wrap up. So, but I'll let Brian cover that. So thank you. Thank you, mayor and council. As the city manager mentioned, it's been a, a, a long month of uh, department presentations and you, you finally made it to the last one of this one. So just putting it all together, uh, we came to a forecast, uh, came to you with a forecast, and then also with some uh, capital improvement program presentations for the non-utilities and utilities. We did a, a budget overview, and then you also had the uh, department budget presentations. So putting that all together, we followed the, our five uh, financial principles for the general governmental, uh, just to kind of re, uh, uh, review those on uh, for the balanced net sources and uses, uh, sustaining programs and services, and then also investment in capital and life cycle replacement. We also have five financial principles for the utility fund uh, that we followed uh, when doing the, the budget. And going through all that, we had the, the emphasis uh, that we presented at the proposed budget. So our, this fiscal year 21-22 budget emphasis was investing on community growth, community safety, meeting community needs and growth, and then also investing in transportation and transit. And then as the city manager mentioned, there's some uh, departments that didn't have a chance to uh, present, but also things added uh, on the request of council. And to, to summarize those, these budget enhancements not presented, uh, three, there's uh, the smart metering support. There will be three positions in business services for that as we implement the, the smart meters. Also the city attorney, uh, an assistant city attorney for the city attorney's office. Uh, in addition to the downtown transformation team, also a marketing and communications specialist for the economic development uh, uh, office, and that is in for the, uh, the business licenses and helping the businesses and helping them with that as part of that, the, the presentation that was uh, presented for, on those business licenses. So that position will help support and uh, support the businesses. Then also, just, the, quick, just quickly, yep. um, Brian, in that conversation, Mayor and Council, the Council seemed to in, be interested in not just collecting information about small businesses through the license, but also using it as a way to communicate with them, share information. And so that's what this position, that would be one of its main responsibilities. Obviously, it could do other work for the Economic Development Department, which they've asked for, but specifically focus on small business marketing and communications. And then also, the, uh, in addition to, we have an outage management system coordinator. I know Frank and Candace spoke a lot on the outage management system and how that can help the residents and also the city. We do have in the budget for next fiscal year a coordinator to oversee uh, that management system. And then at uh, the West Mesa Fleet Service Center, there's in the budget to upgrade the in the uh, CNG fuel station, which will help uh, the environmental management sustainability for fueling their, their trucks. Then also at Fleet Services, a, a new foreman uh, position is added. And then also at the West Mesa Service Center, they'll be upgrading their uh, current camera system. It's just an upgrade from the old cameras to the new cameras and help them with uh, the security and for that. And then also a marketing program assistant at Falcon Field to help promote, because uh, they've been really busy, and, but it's to help promote the economic, uh, uh, economic um, viability of the Falcon Field and promote them even more. And then also four new sworn for fire and medical, captain engineer and two firefighters. 
And then HR uh, will be getting a, an HR information system analyst to help the current one that they have with the workload of uh, with uh, HR and uh, all the systems and everything else. So these are the budget enhancements that kind of weren't that weren't presented. Some of them were added, as the city manager mentioned, but these weren't presented. So going on, this is just a recap of the ones that were presented for community safety, fire, and medical and also police uh, for the four new sworn in there, but also some support uh, services for fire medical. And then on the police side, the additional positions of 11 sworn, uh, and then also the traffic analyst that will uh, be split between the uh, police and then also transportation. And then moving on to meeting community needs and growth. I, kind I, of I, I'm sorry, do you mind going to that, that previous slide? <clears throat> Just because I think it's, it, it'd be nice to get a little bit of an update on the, you know, you know, the voters thankfully supported our, our, our sales tax increase to, to support hiring additional public safety personnel a, a year and a half ago. And so I just want to make sure that we are reporting back to them that we are following through on that, those commitments to hire more police officers and firefighters. And, and that's what this slide represents. But uh, so... The, the slide before this, I was a little concerned because we're getting, you know, a captain and a couple of engineer, an engineer and some firefighters. So it looked like we're getting four new positions, and I thought, oh, geez, that's less than, than I want. But not, not so I see now this slide says no, it's not just those four. It's in addition to that, it's here's a long list of additional firefighters and police officers that we're hiring. Um, but um. so, so that it, and then the, the the academies and training, I guess, is where I want to focus. It says 24 recruits to fill future vacancies. So in, in, uh, the, the impression might be being created that we're hiring eight new uh, firefighters because on the previous page it was two, if it was four, on this page it's four. But then in addition to that, it's 24 recruits to fill future vacancies. So I guess my, my, my question is, to what extent are those 24 just filling in uh, slots that were vacated by attrition? To what extent is that increasing the size of our firefighting force. Can you talk about that for just a minute? Mayor, uh, Council, let me start with the, f the four that you saw on the previous slide. Yeah. Uh, there we had some concerns that we, when we redistributed all of our engines and ladders about two years ago with the data-driven deployment mo model, we put an, two engines at 20 at 218. Our plan all along was to take one of those engines when we opened 221 and move it to 221. We had some concerns about coverage for 205 and 206 that I've discussed at length with Councilmember Freeman, uh, especially at night. So what we did is we will still be, I think 12 of those 24 slots on this next page go to 221. The four on the previous page, we combined with one of our MRUs, our medical response units, that was only daytime that was staffed with eight people. We took the eight people off that, the four new people, and we are leaving an engine on the west side to work between 205 and 206 to make sure our citizens get excellent nighttime coverage in those two areas. So this was, um, in conjunction with fire management, a way to address the issues that we were seeing on the west side while still enabling our ability to cover the growth on the east side. So this is a combination of everything that you asked for. It is filling some vacancies, but it is also new bodies to help on the east and on the west. So, Mayor, what we're doing, too, just to be very clear, is we add bot, we add personnel as we open up new stations, right? So we time it. So first thing, first priority is to fill vacancies through retirements and people leaving. So that's built into the system to make sure we're covered so we never drop below our coverage for every fire station we have. Then on top of that, um, and that if we could go back to the presentations for both police and fire, you would see in there the timing of the academies and how those firefighters are coming out in time to fill the, or to fill the positions for the um, fire stations that are coming on or in, um, for police when police stations are coming on. So, well, no, I should take that back. Firefighters, new firefighters coming on are time related specifically to the timing of opening of new fire stations. Police officers, we're just we're just yeah. hiring them, right? With a with, with an idea that we have to accelerate a little bit, um, or we'll accelerate a little bit more when we get to opening the um, what do we call it? The public safety the, the, the uh, facility. New, new facility. station. New station. Right, yeah. We have a, I can't remember what we call it anymore. Anyway, yeah, you know what? The police and fire <laughs> on right. Brown and Power. Right. <laughs> so yes. so we in, included in here, Mayor, is both 
everything we talked about when police and fire were here to make sure we have the personnel to keep up with attrition and to meet the needs of new fire stations and to add, I can't remember what the number was, Candace or someone remember the total number of police officers we were adding under the public safety sales tax. There was a total number of mayor that we committed to in that sales mm -hmm. tax when we went out and we will meet that obligation over the that, next that's four to five years. That's my question. Yeah. <clears throat> Can you give us a status report on, and, and, I, and I know that's done over, we're ramping up. You can't just yeah. go from zero to- There was a really good, slide and I don't have it mayor and we can send it to the council that PD included in their presentation that showed the academies and then it showed all those officers coming in over the next I don't know four to five years so we can send that back out but it, it, it is consistent with what you see here it's not only showing what we're putting in this budget but every subsequent budget as we're adding um, more officers and you know as I think uh, um, Chief Butler was talking about they're doing multiple academies during the year to make sure we keep up with attrition as well as adding new officers during the time. But I, there was a really good graph. And we, and, I don't have that, Mayor, but we can And get Mayor and Council, one of the things that shouldn't be lost on this is we're running, it by that slide, five academies, three police and two fires in a year. I think three or four years ago, both uh, management teams would have told me that wasn't possible. They've found, both management and staff have found ways to crank out these recruits in a still an amazing training model and yet still meet the demands of attrition and growth. And we're, the public safety sales tax dollars have allowed us to ramp up those training academies to make this possible so that we can meet the demands that we're seeing both in infill and replacement and in new bodies. Great, I guess I, I was just looking for a report. We, we are, are we or are we not on track to yes. meet the goals for hiring additional firefighters and, and, fi and police we, officers we, over we, the yes, course of what, we believe three we are, or four Mayor. years? Yeah, we believe we are. And, and Mayor and Council, just to point out on the fire side, the positions that are related to the Station 221 opening were actually included in last year's budget, so they're already in the budget. That's why you don't see them coming in new here. The positions that are related to Station 222, future opening, will actually be in next year's budget not quite ready to put them in through the academies this year. So again, that's why this year you don't see that big influx of positions. It was one was last year and the other one's gonna be next year. So these are really off cycle positions if you wanna think about them that way. And Mayor, I believe Candace can correct me if I'm wrong, but every decision we've made within the public safety sales tax has been to speed up the hiring of people, not slow it down. Our original plan was here. We've accelerated that program in many different cases to bring more people on to meet the demands that we're seeing. Mr. Freeman. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you for the analysis and being able to keep an engine company on the west side because uh, obviously I think we've found that all hazard units are important because we've had an increase on certain calls on the west side. John, did you mention that you're taking an MR out of service and taking those personnel, those eight personnel, and then you're adding four additional? Mayor, uh, Council Member Freeman, yes. We took the, we're gonna take the MR from 201. 201 currently has three apparatus at it. We did the analysis by, uh, by absorbing those eight bodies into this engine. We did not affect call times whatsoever, response times whatsoever in the 201 area. And it allowed us to hopefully greatly affect our response in the 205, 206 area. Mayor, so, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Well, I just gonna ask, so the MR is not gonna be in service currently, you're not gonna? It, the MR will be available and when we have staffing availability, they staff up as available. Right. So this, M we have other MRs in service. This right. MR will be taken out of everyday service, but will be available when we have the ability to staff it. And the MR unit was just a 12 hour or what? It was a 12 hour peak time unit. 7 A to 7 P, yeah. yep. usually. Yeah, so now we're adding a 24 hour yep. engine. All hazard. Unit. And as part of that, we added, we originally were going to add a third MR. So at the end of the day, the net is still two MRs. Um, so we had two. We were adding a third one to replace, um, to replace that engine. Now that we're keeping the engine, it's really a conversion of that MR to, um, to this. So yeah. at the end of the day, you're going to net still two MRs on the west side. Yeah, and I, I, you know, we, I think that was a reasonable thought to do that. I'm just looking at the, you, you have the analysis to whether we need that MR back in service sometime in the future. We are, I, I will do that as, as yeah. To, as we, we are, look at when we add in the full service unit, we can evaluate that too. Yeah. And actually, fire management and city management with uh, Candace's uh, data scientists are going to meet every December or January to make sure we're tracking all of those things, so that we can see from a budget perspective where we need to add in the future. I have a hard time seeing you with this style in the way, John. You kind of look divided. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, see, Mayor, thank you. Oh, and Mayor, I, was, I, I found a slide for PD when they presented. So um, 
over the years 21, 22 through 24, 25, um, we will see the addition of t a total of 60 personnel. Now, um, of that number, 35 are sworn patrol, and then you have other professional staff. So it is, I think, in, in um, consistent with what we put in the sales tax, and they are showing um, how all those positions are coming on in their budget. So there is a commitment to keep adding those positions as we go. Really Sorry. quick. Mr. Heredia. Yep. Uh, on this slide and the previous slide, are these entirely new positions that we're adding uh, for the city or is it a mix of old positions that we never filled or? No, it's a new positions and, and believe replacement, attrition replacement. It's a combination of both. Uh, both, okay. Yes. Even the the budget enhancement not presented. So by, yeah, mayor. Those council, are new positions. New those positions. are yes, those are new. The on the previous slide, the budget enhancements not presented. These are brand new positions. Brand new. So these are positions that are brand new that were not part of my presentation on the proposed budget. Uh, some of them are, um, but these are brand new positions to the fiscal year 21-22 budget. Okay. And then on the next slide. These are uh, some new positions, but then also some uh, for attrition. Okay. And I would just add, I think all the positions on slide six were in our original proposed budget, except for the marketing specialist for economic development. The marketing specialist. Oh, and the captain engineers and, and the uh, two firefighters. Yes. We've added those since the conversation with discussion with council. We needed just, we weren't, we were still doing the evaluation on fire while they were presenting to the council. So since then, John's been able to meet with them and have discussions, and then we made the decision with the recommendation to um, convert essentially the MR units to a full engine. And, th and that's where that, that's why we're adding, we want to make sure council knows about that idea. And then after the conversation we had about business licensing and the council wanted to use that list as a way to communicate with small businesses, we added the other position, the economic development. So those are new outside of what was in our original proposed budget that we presented to you at the beginning. Just for those of us who aren't uh, retired firefighters or assistant city managers <laughs> over public safety, I know what an MR unit is. I oh, promise. sorry. I'm sorry. We, yes. Could you just, just medical? It's a medical response unit, and yeah. so they are our two-person units right. um, that go out and just respond to the medical. I'm sorry. Are they're four, four sorry. They're four-person four four person response, um, but they respond to the medical. They don't respond to fire. These are those four-door pickup trucks. The four-door trucks. That's there you go, Mayor. So, so we were talking about. We're still talking about a team. So when we talk about a team. We're still talking about a captain, an engineer, and two firefighters. They're just not on an engine. Got it. Um, they're on a different vehicle. Um, that's a little bit more mobile and can get them out to the medical calls. Now, I, I just, a little correction, I think they do respond to fires. They just are part that of the staffing crew on, on their, fir their first Their first priority, their first priority, their first priority is to respond to medical. They right. can, they, if needed. They do respond. We had, I want to make yeah, sure the public knows. Mayor, Council, we had two different MRs respond to the most recent fire downtown, and what they do is they, they get off, they take their equipment, and then they cycle in with the other in people oh, yeah. on the ladder trucks or and or engines and pumpers. So yes, you are correct. correct. They they do respond. Their primary is medical, but they're available for response. Yeah, and, and they to still be, have their turnout here. To be clear, the reason they are medical first is because based on the data, and this is countrywide, and I was doing this in my previous life, the majority of calls, over 70% of calls responded to are medical. Mm -hmm. And so in an effort to be more efficient in our response, instead of sending a big pumper to every type of medical call, we set up these units so that they could be <coughs> able to, certainly with four persons, they can handle um, an acute call, a significant call, um, they can, all levels of medical calls. But as, as Councilman Freeman was saying, at the same time, they are available to be a backup and support if there's a fire. But their primary call, frankly, is to keep the fire engine in the station while they go respond to the medical call and keep the engine and all that equipment available for the higher hazard um, calls that might come in. So that's, that's the, I guess, strategy for their use. <clears throat> Thank you for clarifying that. 
So continuing on with the, the, the themes, meeting community needs and growth, uh, this was also presented previously, but just a recap on the support for homeless service coordination plan. Uh, we have the, the, just to highlight some of them, are the community court program navigators, the three additional uh, navigators, then also uh, four additional park rangers for the parks, and then down in the growth and the development, we, all, we added the, a plans examiner, but also a, a planner for um, development services, and then also another uh, economic development specialist. And then investing in community growth, for the uh, education workforce development, we have the Mesa K Ready, and then also the Mesa Promise in the budget, and then there's the, the support for small business assistance programs of the 300,000 to support the business builder. And then also we have the, the support community re-engagement in the arts, and that's the equipment and commodities in preparation for reopening the facilities. Then investing in the transportation and transit, as mentioned before, the, the big ones for that is the, the, continue, the master plan for transportation, but also the uh, traffic analyst uh, that will be shared with PD. And then on the transit side, uh, the expanding of the services along Mesa Drive, Stapley Drive, and Broadway Road, and then also a study for the bus shelters and adding 10 new uh, bus sh uh, shelter shade for design and construction. So wrapping that all up, on finalizing the budget, uh, just to remind everybody, state requires that all expenses occurring in the fiscal year are, should be are need to be included in the annual legal adopted budget, and that includes any carryover for uh, operations, any uh, expenses that are related to large projects. We carry those over. Uh, into the next fiscal year. And then also for grants, expenses and revenues for grants we carry over so we have the budgetary capacity uh, to continue those. And then adopting the budget, uh, which we'll do on March, on May 17th, when we adopt the tentative budget, that sets the maximum expenditure the city can incur in one fiscal year. Uh, that does include a contingency fund. Uh, to which helps with any unexpected uh, or unanticipated expenses throughout the year that we can uh, uh, help fund. And then the next, as I mentioned, for the budget process calendar on May 17th will be the adoption of the five-year capital improvement uh, program. As mentioned before, we did the, uh, the presentations on the non-utilities and utilities uh, during the April presentations. But then also it's on May 17th is the tentative adoption of the annual budget. And then we'll come back two weeks later and do a public hearing on the annual budget and then also a public hearing for the secondary property tax levy, and then uh, council will uh, take action on adopting the final uh, budget. So thank you, Brian. Just mayor and council, just a reminder, um, we're required to um, establish the tentative budget, and that's why we do that on the 17th, and it has to be available for like certain number of days to be published, two weeks? Yeah, two weeks. So we have to publish that and put that out there prior to the public hearing on the 7th, and then um, that's when the adoption is. So that's just to understand why it's coming up in May. The actual adoption doesn't take place the 7th, but we're required to publish the, the document, publish the, the tentative budget for um, the public so they can make, if they have any comments, they can make, have those comments on June 7th. Thank you. And then last but not least, on June 21st, it will be the adoption of the secondary property tax levy. And with that, that would end the, uh, the city budget process. All right. Thank you very much. That was, uh, this has been a, a fascinating year to talk about finances, given uh, the context of all the, all the federal funding that we're receiving and how that, that fits in. And, and actually, that's the, the next two agenda items I see on, on this meeting is to talk about the rest of this equation with, with all of the extraordinary funding that's coming in due to, uh, to the coronavirus relief uh, funding that we're receiving. Council, any uh, additional questions for these gentlemen? Uh, Mr. Thompson, Mr. Luna, are you okay? Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate uh, all the work that's gone into to the budget discussions. Next item on our agenda is to hear a presentation, discuss, and provide funding recommendations for fiscal year 1920 CARES funding related to COVID-19 for Emergency Solutions Grant Coronavirus Funding. <clears throat> Ladies, good to see you. Michelle and Ruth. 
Good morning, Mayor and Council. Ruth Giese here, a Community Services Director. And uh, beside me is Michelle Albanese, Housing and Community Development Director. As we get going here, today we are going to be reviewing two items for um, Council recommendation and approval. The first is the Emergency Solutions Grant Phase 2. And um, this funding is actually the second funding source that the federal government sent to us. The first round came earlier in the process and Mayor and Council approved that in April of 2020. So today this is the second round of funding of about $4 million. The second funding is the Community Development Block Grant funding and both of these funding sources are for coronavirus impact. So they were specifically given to the city um, based on the CARES Act of 2020. So both of these funding sources we'd like to talk with you in more detail about. Other funding related to the pandemic, such as the rescue dollars, that will be, is being reviewed by um, city management and recommendations will be forthcoming at a later date for council review. So today it's just the ESG, Emergency Solutions Grant, and the CDBG solution, uh, CV related funding. So with that, Michelle Albanese is gonna go in more detail about both funding sources. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Last month, we presented to you the funding recommendations for fiscal year 21-22. And today, as Ruth mentioned, we're coming to you with the coronavirus funding, so specifically for um, COVID-19 activities. So just wanna give a quick overview of how we um, arrived at the funding allocations that we'll be presenting to you here in just a moment. In developing those presentations, um, funding recommendations, we looked at the city council priorities and support for city programs as well as other programs that address homelessness in the community. We also looked at programs and services that would be eligible for the ESG COVID dollars. So some of the activities that agencies applied for in the fiscal year 21-22 wouldn't necessarily meet these requirements. We considered agencies in the CDBG um, program that were partially funded, and those activities do translate to um, eligibility for ESG, so we were able to supplement additional funding. We looked at agencies who applied in the human services funding but were not able to be funded due to the um, high demand. And finally, we looked at programs and services that were funded through the first round of ESG COVID dollars and we're gonna be recommending to um, allocate additional funds to those programs and services. One of the most important pieces is to also, not only are the activities eligible under ESG COVID, but that the agencies can administer the program with the federal requirements. Just a recap, I know we talked last year for ESG COVID when it first came out. Um, this program is specifically to address homeless needs in the community and activities that are eligible include homeless prevention, rapid rehousing, as well as navigation services in the community and shelter operations. And specifically for the ESG COVID, we're looking at um, Mesa residents that have been directly impacted by COVID. So this, do this money can only be used for COVID related activities. We're looking at the urgency, um, what are the needs in the community, as well as to assist the most vulnerable at this time. With that, I'd like to transition to the actual recommendations. And you'll see we have it color-coded and I'll explain that there is some, um, a reason to my madness here with the colors. So if we look at the first section for the agencies that are highlighted in blue, those agencies competitively um, submitted applications through the first round of ESG COVID-1. And so we are recommending to provide level funding to those agencies. They've been successful in administering those programs um, and services, and they have a need to continue um, to address the COVID-related issues. 
I just want to point out, um, as I mentioned, level funding, with the exception of the first agency that's listed in blue for a new leaf, they originally had asked for money for their shelter operations as well as expansion of um, their beds, tenant additional beds. So we are funding them this time just for their shelter operations since they already have those beds. We went with this, and I think you mentioned, but I think it's worth emphasizing that these groups were, were in the original uh, funding, and uh, as far as staff can tell, they are both capable of, they've done a very good job of spending, the, providing the, the services, as well as these are agencies that we're comfortable with or can administer or, what's my, um, they can administer the federal dollars. They have the capacity to do that. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. That is correct. Thank you. So as we transition um, into the orange, that is the um, city program operation off the streets, uh, one of the city council priorities. And so we're able to provide funding to that program through ESG COVID. As we move to the yellow, these are agencies that did apply in the fiscal year 21-22 process. So it was a competitive process. They were awarded CDBG funds, partial funding. So what we did here is it's all score based. So with their original request, we did a percentage of additional funding that we could provide based on their score. They've already re partial dollars they received in the, the first round. That is correct. I can give you an example. So for example, um, a new leaf had requested $200,000 for their shelter services and they were awarded 100,000 through CDBG. So with this additional funding based on their score, we're able to fund an additional 60,000 to support their operations. And then finally, the agencies that are highlighted in green, these are agencies that we looked at who applied for human service dollars but were not funded and we needed to make sure that their activity would be eligible under the ESG COVID grant and these would be, they all address homeless services. Um, and so we were able to provide funding in this category, again, based on score. So it was a percentage of their original um, request. And so with that, um, we would like to recommend these um, funding awards for a total of 3765000 That includes the City of Mesa administration. And there will be a small balance um, left over, which could be used to supplement and support these programs if needed, or to fund another program um, through CDBG, which I'll be talking about in just a moment. So Mayor and Council, when we came to you with the list for CDBG and the general fund, human services funds, there were obviously, we couldn't fund everybody in council, we, but we did say, um, there's more coming, more dollars coming. And so that's today when we said, listen, there were some that we couldn't fully fund in their full re in their request or some that didn't get funded at all under human services. And we said, but we are more federal dollars are coming. And we, we talked about how we would come back and try to bring some of those agencies either providing additional funding from what they received in that first round or providing um, funding that they didn't receive at all. So that's what... We, well, that's why I think Michelle's gone through this just to show you we're trying to follow up from that um, discussion we had a month ago or so. Yes. so okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think we all remember that discussion and, and just saying to the agencies, be patient. Right. I think you're, we're going to be able to fund you eventually. Uh, all of this is very, um, very clear. Um, but uh, again, for those of us who might not be <coughs> clued into all of the vocabulary, uh, Autumn House, can you describe, uh, I, I know it's, we've had it forever but it's just not evident by the name what, what services are being provided by Autumn House. Sure, thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, I believe that Autumn House is for domestic violence, um, and so it does serve residents in the community that um, are, are having issues with domestic violence, and so that's what that shelter is for. That's, that's my understanding as well, okay. Thank you, Mr. Heredia. On the city programs, where, where do these uh, these programs housed in uh, who is I think it's a mix of departments right that right so that you'll have in here specific. well CBI is going to be the navigators when you always say commute bridges so we when we have the individuals <laughs> that are unsheltered and we um, house them in the hotel rooms we also make sure there are services there to meet that meet meet with them and work with them and Natalie and 
Aaron have set that up so that we make sure that it's not just putting them in a sure. room, but there's a tremendous amount of support. I don't know how many navigators this is. Natalie, do you want to talk about that? Um, so I, I believe we have, it, I, it's a combination of, of a whole bunch of different CBI staff and what they need at, at any given time. So that shifts and, and flows a, as their need is. But um, where this is really housed is the contract for these services will be housed out of community, community. Uh, out of community yeah. services. The, um, the work that we're doing on the ground is absolutely cross-departmental. Yeah. Yeah. But the, the department it is housed and managed is this, clean. These contracts it, are, this, yeah. yes. Okay. All yes. three contracts? Or, yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, mayor, mayor. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Vice Mayor. Uh, that, that's okay, Mr. Luna. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I just wanted to thank uh, Michelle and, and Ruth. Uh, you know, we have this problem every year. We have a pot of money, and uh, it's always a challenge, uh, especially when we have the CCD meeting to try to allocate the funds. And we're very fortunate that we have these extra COVID dollars to provide. Uh, the agency's additional dollars. And I know that they worked really hard uh, to fund the agencies that we weren't able to fund the first time. So uh, I want to thank them personally for doing that, reaching out to the agencies. But I also want to express my gratitude to the agencies who were who were patient, who were a little nervous about not getting the, the initial uh, rent, um, funding. And But uh, I'm glad that they were patient, and I'm glad that uh, Michelle and Ruth and their staff were able to continue funding these agencies that provide the wraparound service to many of our members here in the city of Mesa and the, and, and the services. So, so thank you agencies for being patient and thank you Michelle and Ruth uh, uh, for working so hard to, to fund the agencies that, that do a really good job for the city of Mesa. So thank you. Thanks thank Mr. You. Luna, Vice Mayor. Yes, I'm so happy to see these monies flowing into our agencies to provide the services that we need to weather the rest of the storm. <coughs> I just wanted to have a clarification for my own mind. And homeless prevention, I see there's a couple of line items there under that category. And what are those services in comparison to, we have the emergency rental and utility assistance that we're doing in the city. Is it an, the same type of services or how is it different? Mayor and Council, um, thank you very much. That's a good question. So um, one of the agencies, uh, Save the Family, they do the prevention and they serve solely families. So some of the other money that we're using for the eviction prevention, that's for a, a different you know, array of folks, um, as well as the income is different. So with ESG, it's a lower income bracket as um, the other dollars that we are using are a higher in income bracket. So the emergency utility and rent, um, rental assistance that we do, that we house within the city, there are parameters around income and if it fits better and they would be referred to like Save the Family or Mesa Can, or is that how that works? Yes, Mayor and Council. We absolutely collaborate with the agencies. So if there happens to be, um, say, a uh, family that's not eligible through, say, Save the Family because they're over income, we could try to assist them through a different program here. So we definitely work together. Um, there's different restrictions on the different money and, and different programs. Okay. And when do these funds go into, when are they awarded? Is it into the new fiscal year or as soon as we, you know, bless these, they're going to be <laughs> expired? Do we have the dollars now? Thank you. Yes, actually, um, these were allocated to the city back in 2019. So they came out in different phases as the guidance came out from HUD. And so it's available as soon as the recommendations are approved and we submit our request to HUD, then we do have those dollars. But we are able to go ahead and enter into contracts with the agencies for the services. And that was kind of a benefit of the COVID dollars is that they wanted the money out quickly so some of the other processes could follow. So I would assume then it would be in a short amount of time from the approval process for the agencies receiving the monies and being able to continue their work? That is correct. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Council, other questions on this item? Uh, 
Remind me, I know we talked about uh, an additional strategic position that we're adding uh, going forward, I believe, is a, a human services coordinator, right? And, and, and I, I love what we're doing. I love that we've, we've got the resources now to really, in a meaningful way, uh, address all these critical human service needs that we have in our community, uh, some that were made more obvious and, and uh, more serious by the pandemic, but others that predated the pandemic. And <clears throat> it just, uh, and we've got a lot of wonderful people on our staff that are, that are running these programs. I'm excited about the, the, the idea, though, that we might have bring in a quarterback to kind of uh, help us avoid having a bunch of silos within even our own organization. Uh, for example, dur during the, the veterans homelessness uh, campaign that we participated and still are participating in, we, we were made aware of the, the importance of having a, a list by name of the individuals that we're working with. That, that, that really humanizes it and it helps us realize that, you know, this is uh, an individual and, and uh, it's, a, it's somebody that we can have a relationship with and somebody we want to care about and, and track their progress. Um, and I, with all of the things that were going on, I'm just, I'm just hoping that we don't, that, that we, I'm looking forward to having that quarterback come in and say, hey, where's, let's start a, a by name list so that we can see, uh, you know, if, uh, if we're, we just need to coordinate, I guess. But can you talk a little bit about when that, uh, the role that person is going to have and when that person's going to come on and, and how all of these buckets of money, you know, that we're talking about today and uh, are, are going to be coordinated by someone? Thank you, Mayor and Council. The Human Services Coordinator, we envision really being our uh, quarterback, as you um, said, for our homelessness activities. So for example, all the agencies here related to homelessness, we wanna be connected with all those agencies. We wanna know um, how they're doing, what other additional support they have, are we all working together, uh, making sure we're not um, duplicating services, that we're really reaching out to those that haven't had the opportunity to take advantage of services. That person will also really serve as a conduit with our Operation Off the Streets campaign, you know, working closely with CBI, with Aaron Rain, and then also serve as a um, resource for the city manager's office, uh, for mayor and council, if there's a question, if we're not sure what's happening, a uh, point in time count, um, that person would be overseeing that area as well. We. Um, Michelle and her team will continue to be kind of the managers of the contracts and all the money and, every, and making sure that we're, we're meeting federal requirements, whereas the human services coordinator will really serve as that resource of information, uh, probably a working at a, re, you know, definitely at a regional level as well. And, and also working with, we will be um, having uh, an additional housing uh, services specialist as well, uh, perhaps working on with that team to make sure that we're uh, reaching out to landlords to incentivize landlords to also be working with us with our housing stability programs. So it's uh, we really hope um, that we can add to that. At first, it's going to be boots on the ground running with all our homelessness activities. But then uh, as we gather more information, that person's really going to be that expert for us. Okay, thank you. I'm sure we'll, we'll all be very familiar with that person <laughs> and, and uh, they'll be an important part of our team. Thank you. Thank you. I, 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 the next agenda item, Mr. Brady, is it the same cast of characters? Uh, <laughs> Oh, I apologize. Please proceed. <laughs> no problem. No, no. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Just one more slide. Um, this just illustrates the proposed allocations um, by category for the eligible activities for ESG COVID-2. And then finally, um, we would request that the City Council um, approve the recommendations as provided or if there are any other changes to the recommendations. All right, so this is agendized to provide funding recommendations. We don't need a motion on this, do we? We I think do. We would, Mayor, because okay. we're acting for a specific recommendation so we can start entering into contracts with these agencies. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, so, Council, we have a, some, some specific funding recommendations that are proposed by staff. Is there a motion to support these recommendations? Thank you, Vice Mayor, and seconded by Ms. Spilsbury. Any additional discussion on this item? Uh, if, if not, let's just do a voice vote. All in favor of the motion, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Any opposed? Thank you. That passes unanimously. Thank you for your good work, ladies. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Now, next uh, agenda item, again, I'm, I'm guessing it might be the same uh, pre presenters. Yeah, they're, they're, they're on a roll, Mayor. We're going to keep them up here. Thank you. And so <laughs> just, just for the record, the ne next we'll talk about the CDBG funding uh, aspect of this, correct? Correct. Okay, go Thank ahead. Thank you, Mayor and Council. You're going to be tired of seeing us up here after a <laughs> no, while. No, we're not. <laughs> okay, so this will be a, a quick presentation. Um, we wanted to talk to you about the CDBG COVID dollars. So similar to the ESG, these dollars have to be used specifically for um, community residents that have been impacted by COVID. We have approximately $6 million in um, the CDBG funds. And HUD had issued several waivers when the CARES Act was, um, was approved. And so different from our normal CDBG funds, we do not have a public service cap or limit on these funds. So any of the activities that we fund, it could be 100% public services. They could also just be um, non-public service just as the regular CDBG funds. We will be doing a competitive application process and that will begin later this month. And we'll be looking at obviously those activities that are eligible for CDBG and also directly related to COVID. And then we hope to return back to City Council before the end of summer break so that we get approval for those funding recommendations and enter into contracts. What I wanted to present to you today um, was just some high level proposed priorities for the uh, Community Development Block Grant COVID funds. And um, we've heard over the last several months that education and workforce development has been um, very important and a priority for the council. So this would be uh, a general funding um, category that could be used for the COVID dollars. Health services, and this could run the gamut from being mobile health services, uh, mental health services, addiction services, um, and then emergency and bridge to housing or wh what we're calling the path to recovery. So really filling the gaps for emergency housing um, such as domestic violence or um, children that are out of the foster care system and they're homeless or um, young youth with, with children. So that's kind of the range of um, activities that we're looking for, as well as food and basic services. So anybody that's been impacted by COVID um, could, could receive services through these funds. So Mayor and Quit Council, just make sure the subtly this doesn't pass you what we're asking you to we just want to get your concurrence um that we've kind of identified these as priorities and what that means is as we go through the solicitation from the nonprofits, from the agencies for the the six million dollars we are essentially informing the agencies with this um these priorities if this is what council would like us to focus on is if they make if they submit proposals that are related to one of the any one of these priorities, it essentially gives them um, higher consideration and the points we allocate for determining you know who's eligible to receive a portion of that six million. So it's just it's like we did previously um, months ago with the. Um, annual CDBG cycle where we sit down with council and say, what are your priorities? And we use that in our scoring so that if, if we have agencies who submit sp something specifically related to um, senior food services or whatever, that's a priority. Then we will, we, as we look at the scoring and the submittals, I mean, the, the priorities obviously have one part of it. We have to look at their capacity to spend the money, their experience in spending money, their administration. There's a lot of other factors, but this is something that we put out there so that the nonprofits also see, oh, if I want to maybe improve my chances of receiving funding, I'm going to look for something, maybe mobile uh, health care services or something like that, that may help me based on this to get a higher consideration in the scoring. So I hope that that's what, that's why we're here is not that somebody couldn't get funding that was outside of this, but those that would submit that are related to this specifically, 
would be given consideration. And I just want to make Councilman Heredia acknowledge that workforce development component we put at top. You've been talking to us a lot about that, so that's that's on here too. Anyway, so that's what this is. And if you're comfortable with that, great. Or if there's something else or maybe a clarification of what these priorities are, this is mm -hmm. the time to tell us we're going to take your direction today based on these priorities and then come and go through the solicitation, the scoring, and then come back in September, August, September, what'd you say? Um, we'd like to come back prior to council break. Oh, so in July, June yeah. or July, so soon. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's a quick turnaround, so. Okay, thank you. Yes, I, I, I like, I'll just lead off by saying I like these priorities. I think it, it reflects uh, what we've done previously, particularly related to COVID. We're prioritizing basic needs. We have food and, and uh, shelter, uh, health service and, and uh, emergency response as well as uh, education and workforce development, which I think is you know, the pathway out for uh, the, the population that we're talking about helping here. So um, personally, I'll say that, that yes, I, I, I endorse and, so, and, and like this list of priorities. Council, let's go with Vice Mayor and then Mr. Freeman. I just had one thought and, it, and it's just not thought out because I just thought about it. Child care seems to be a huge issue in COVID and we've lost a lot of workforce because of child care and it is an, a, a basic need that even before COVID but I know we're talking about COVID dollars here um, I don't even know if there's agencies or vehicles in, in a way to address child care or provide assistance for anybody so they could get back to work if they had more help with the child care mm -hmm. issue Mayor and Council, there absolutely could be um, agencies out there that are providing those types of services, and we could be sure if that was a priority of Council um, that we tried to contact and reach out and just try to get the word out that we'll be looking for these types of services as well. Uh, child care is an eligible public service under CDBG. It's related to COVID. And Vice Mayor, I think to your point, if we find a, if an agency came in, was offering that to assist someone so they could be employed, and have a job. I think that fits in with that first category for sure. And with the workforce development. Mm -hmm. So that would so be I think so. We, I think we would consider that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, that, that's great. And usually on our CDGB dollars, I know this is COVID related, but in our general fund that we do annually, what is the total figure? How does this compare? This is six million. What do we usually oh. do? <laughs> We're not, we're not, what are we at? <laughs> so, um, thank you, Mayor and Council. Our normal allocation is just over four million. So, um, we, for 21, 22, we'll have the four million, plus we have the six million in the CDBG. Wow, this is a year to yeah, make true is... impact and really yes. move our community into a healthy, sustainable life. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Freeman, then Mr. Radio. Thank you, Mayor. Ladies, I was just, in the prior uh, presentation, I was thinking about food banks and how food banks may, are they eligible for applying for this too, on food distribution? Yes, Mayor and Council, um, any type of activity related to food, as long as they're a nonprofit and they meet the other criteria for CDBG, then yes, that would be an eligible activity. So in that, what are they eligible for? I mean, do they, like I was <clears throat> thinking uh, any, in order to expand their uh, ability to deliver services, can they, uh, like tenant improvements, I mean, is it, can they do that? I mean, what can they apply for? Say a food bank wants to apply, obviously we've worked very hard in the past, with United Food Yeah, bank. Councilor Freeman, in the past, and they've applied for equipment, for refrigerators, uh, freezers maybe, um, so, because the food side, food supply, they seem through the federal government to get a lot of the food supply, but it's more the logistic support of facility expansion, equipment. We got um, trailers, I know. Trailers. So those are, I think that's been more typical of what they have come to us most recently with. So request. what would you be your expectation now if a food bank came to you? Um, well, yeah. The one right now... Um, the discussions we're having is trying to help um, the food bank find um, a more um, permanent location for their distribution okay. because the current, well, obviously they're not at the um, convention center parking lot anymore. So they, their site at, Hav I think it's Havelina, is just doesn't. Yeah, they're compromised. It, it's very difficult. Now. So um, we've been in discussions with them, Mr. Hirschberg has, and um, they are 
look at currently looking for um, alternative permanent sites, and so um, either through this now this would that you know that would be a large ask for this, but we are talking with them about um, maybe related to the rescue funds once we understand those. But but again, even without that, if they came to us for equipment or serv or um, and even food, correct? I mean, yeah, it could be food off of this. It, too. Yeah, I, I think so. I, I don't for distribution it, in the community. Yeah. It's usually right. been the things that are harder for them to fund are, are more the equipment and facilities. That seems to be their biggest ask when they come to us. Well, I, I think I go back to the mayor's comment. Some of our basic needs and services as a human is we need food to eat and to provide those services. It, the logistic component is important, but the ability to distribute that is, sure. is the other side of it. Sure. So food and distribution, and uh, I, I like the list here. And I really like the workforce development. I think uh, having that component for individuals to improve their their ability to work is great if they're willing to do that. So I appreciate Council Member Heredia suggesting that. Mr. Reddy, question on, you had mentioned these funds are from the previous COVID uh, relief package last year. There's also subsequent relief packages much recently. Um, do we anticipate get, uh, getting additional pools of funding? I know I asked this question, but as far as timeline wise, there's another pool of funding that might be coming in for, I don't, I don't know if it's CDBG or ESG or some of these pools that we can also uh, support agencies and other members of the community. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Absolutely, yeah. Mayor and Council. So um, the CARES Act provided all of the funding that we've been coming to you with. Um, it's been, released in different phases. So that's why we're coming to you now with the CDBG. Um, the only additional funding that I'm aware of right now is potential home dollars through the new um, new funding allocations. And that would be directly for um, taking homeless individuals and getting them into more permanent supportive housing, possibly into housing choice voucher um, down the road or acquisition and rehabilitation of units. So it'd be directly for like supply of housing. I haven't heard that there's any additional CDBG or ESG dollars, but that's not to say that there wouldn't be. Okay. Specifically talking about the American. So now it's separate country. and I think we have, this does not include, that would be another discussion. Another, yes. another discussion, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry, thank you. Uh, I, this is also agendized for to, <clears throat> to provide direction. So, um, Council, is there a motion to support uh, staff's recommendation of these priorities? Thank you, Ms. Billsbury, uh, seconded by Mr. Heredia. Uh, Heredia, excuse me. We'll, we'll do a voice vote. All in favor, uh, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Any opposed? Thank you. That passes unanimously. Thanks again, Thank ladies, you for much. your hard work on this. <clears throat> the next item on our agenda is item two. Uh, this item we will continue to a future council meeting. Item three is current event summary, including meetings and conferences attended. Council, who'd like to, to begin? Okay. Vice Mayor. Um, on Tuesday evening, I attended uh, the ben Benedictine University um, Joe Wilson Leadership Dessert Reception, and Mayor Giles was there and recognize the mentees and uh, mentors of uh, many of the, the students at Benedictine University, our first generation um, college students, and they're very determined, they're phenomenal, they're gonna rock this world. And I wanna thank Benedictine University uh, for um, lifting the community and providing this opportunities for education, mentoring our future leaders. Um, yesterday, I attended uh, Arizona League of Cities Sustainability and Quality of Life um, Committee meeting, which we discussed electric vehicle charging stations, recycling and energy efficiencies, um, our needs and possible policy proposals. And uh, last night, I attended the Consulate General of Mexico of Phoenix at a Cinco de Mayo celebration. It was a fundraising event benefiting the nonprofit Friendly House is a scholarship program for students. So, uh, thank you. Ms. Spilsbury. 
Yeah, just real quick, um, I wanted to thank RJ and his staff for showing me the traffic management center. It's always fascinating to me to see the behind the scenes work that goes on that we take for granted every day when we're driving around. And <laughs> so thank you to them and all of their hard work there. Um, Mayor? Yes, Mr. F uh, Mr. Luna. Uh, uh, yesterday I served on the awarding committee for Mesa Community College's Endowed Teacher Chair Award led by MCC President uh, Dr. Lori Berkwam. Uh, three finalists for the board gave presentations to the awarding committee demonstrating their excellence in providing quality, quality instruction and engaging in innovative and effective teaching practices. Uh, they, the selected uh, faculty member will be awarded with a cash award. And so we want to congratulate the faculty members that was selected. And I probably won't make it public. I'll let the, the college make that public. So, uh, and also last night I joined in the Arizona Department of Health Services telephonic uh, town hall with Carrie Pena and Dr. Kara Chris discussing the value of getting vaccinated. Uh, this important event helped answer community questions around the safety and efficacy of the COVID-19 vaccine and encouraged all Arizonans to get vaccinated. As you know, I'm very passionate about ensuring that all our residents get vaccinated in order to protect public health and to allow us to get back to normal. And I'm happy that I had the opportunity to share the message with City of Mesa District 3 and District no 5 generous. residents. Thank you, Mr. Luna. Are, are you done? Yes, I am, Mayor. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for all you're doing for us, Mr. Luna. We appreciate it. Council, other, other comments? Mr. Freeman. I'll just add, I, I attended the uh, Public Safety Committee meeting for the Arizona League of Cities, and it's quite informative. Had a, a robust discussion. Great, thanks. You're the right person to be there. Thanks for doing that. Other comments? Um, I, <clears throat> I haven't mentioned this previously, but for the last uh, year or so, I've been serving as the chairman of the Mayor's Education Roundtable, which is just the, lo the state of Arizona uh, it's a gathering facilitated by <clears throat> West Ed and Helios of, uh, in about every two or three months we have a meeting and, and talk about different education related topics and it's been uh, my honor to, to serve as the chair of that for the last year or so. Uh, we did have a, a, a very informative meeting yesterday on early childhood education and, and pre-K efforts. I was proud to talk about what we're doing in the city of Mesa, uh, but there's, there's, that's a topic that sometimes uh, we don't talk about as much as we should and, and I'm still interested in looking for additional ways for us to, to get better at that. We're right now in the city of Mesa about a third of our kids get uh, some sort of uh, introduction to education before they show up uh, to, to, to a kindergarten, their first day of kindergarten and that, that's below the national average which is about 50 percent. So th this is something that as a community and as a state we need to get better at and I appreciate all of the uh, the folks in our community that have contributed money and, and resources, and and uh, I'm looking forward to our workforce development and education roundtable uh, convening and and uh, helping us to figure out a, a path forward to get better at that as well. Uh, <clears throat> Council, anything else you'd like to share with us, Mr. Thompson, Mr. Luna, you're you're good. All right, Mr. Brady, what does our schedule of future meetings look like? Thank you, Mayor. Just a reminder, uh, there'll be an audit and finance committee meeting. Um, at, oh, good, at, at, immediately following this meeting. And then our next study session will be May 13th, which will be followed by a city council meeting on May 17th. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes the items on our agenda for this meeting. Is there a motion to adjourn? Thank you, Mr. Freeman, seconded by Mr. Redia. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. We are adjourned. <laughs>